Well, good Sunday morning, First Baptist Church, and as always, thank you for tuning in today. So on the church calendar, today is Palm Sunday, which means next week is Resurrection Sunday, and I want to invite you to join us in person next Sunday, if you're able to. 9.30 a.m., right here in the auditorium, where we gather together, we will worship God together, celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ together. I hope you can join us in person. But Palm Sunday today, we reflect on Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's riding into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey in fulfillment of messianic prophecy, and the people are crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Save us, King of Israel. But what the crowds on that day don't realize is what Jesus is riding into Jerusalem to do. Yes, it is to provide salvation for God's people, but not in the way that they think and understand. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem to die on a cross for our sins so that our sins would be paid for in full and we would be reconciled in a right relationship to God. That's what the crowds missed on that day. Although Jesus tells them, he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus is speaking about his death that's what he's riding into Jerusalem to do. And they're securing for God's people salvation from sin and rescue from death. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer as we begin today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, the one you sent as a perfect and sinless substitute, taking our place on the cross and dying for our sins that those sins would be paid for in full and forgiven, and we would be brought into right relationship with you and how we give you praise today for this great salvation. And Father, I pray today that as we sit before your word, you would grant wisdom and insight, application, understanding. Father, that we might be transformed more and more into Christ's likeness. And Father, we do ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Christina. And as we have often done in this letter of 1 Peter, in our journey through 1 Peter, we hit the pause button last week right in the middle of a section, a, a section where Peter is talking about the fiery ordeal, the fiery trial of persecution that these believers are facing as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's, he's teaching them how to respond to this fiery ordeal. And we left an essential and important part of this section just waiting there for us for this week. 
So let's go right back to it today. 1 Peter chapter 4, we will focus in on verses 17 through 19, but let's read the section, starting back up in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if, if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who also suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So you might remember last week, we looked at verses 12 through 16. Just a quick bit of review here. Peter is turning his attention back to the fiery trial of persecution these believers are facing, and, and we will face too to some degree, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus made that clear. We will, we will face this persecution too. And we saw in this section two pairs of commands. The first pair was in verses 12 and 13, a negative and positive command. The negative command, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you for your testing. I mean, this is God refining you, burning off all that worthless stuff we would look to other than Christ. Nothing strange is happening here. Don't be surprised. And then the other side of that command, the positive side is, and keep on rejoicing to the degree that you suffer. For the name of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Rejoicing now, which Peter says is anticipatory and even preparatory for the great rejoicing we will know one day at the revelation of Jesus Christ, and rejoicing now that the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You are blessed. And we have the Holy Spirit to come along in the midst of that reviling, the Spirit of God in us who refreshes us and comforts us and strengthens us in the midst of that trial. And then we have the second pair of commands down there in verse 16. If you suffer as a Christian... If this is the accusation and the charge thrown your way, do not be ashamed, but glorify God in this name. Praise God that you bear the name of Christ. And that's where we stopped last week, so we'll pick right back up there. That brings us to verse 17, which begins, you will notice, with the word for or because. It connects back up with verse 16. Here's why we glorify God in this name. As we suffer for the name of Christ, we glorify God in this name. Why? Because it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? You see, verse 17 and even verse 18 are a support for glorify God in this name. So let's do this. Let's look at the details of verse 17, and then we will relate it to glorifying God in that name. And as we turn to verse 17, it will be helpful for us to think through some terms first here. So Peter says it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Let's start there. What's the household of God? We saw the same kind of language, house or household, back in chapter 2 and verse 5, where Peter describing believers, he says, you as living stones. He calls believers living stones. You as living stones are being built into a spiritual house. There's the same term. A spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So the picture there is of individual believers being built together, certainly placed upon the chief cornerstone of the Lord Jesus Christ, but believers being built together into the spiritual household of God. So the house or the household of God, those are believers. 
That is the people of God, whom God has fitted together upon Christ. Or we could simply say it this way, the household of God is the church. Another term here in this verse. It is time to begin the judgment with the household of God. It is time to begin. Well, what's Peter getting at with this idea of time here? Well, the word time is not the word for chronological time, but rather it's the other word for time we see all over the place in the New Testament, and that is, it is the season. It is the appointed season. That's the idea of time here. It is the fixed and God-ordained season for judgment to begin. So Peter is saying, it is the God-ordained season to begin the judgment, and it starts with the household of God. What Peter is doing here is he is placing what these believers are going through, the fiery trial that has come upon the church, he is placing it on the timeline of God's redemptive work and plan. So remember the big picture. Peter said earlier, the end of all things is near. And as the church eagerly awaits the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, what's going on in this season? God is refining his people. He's refining his spiritual household for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And that refinement includes the fiery trial. And later when we get to judgment, I'm going to argue that's what, that's what the judgment is, this fiery trial. But the point here is how do you explain this fiery trial that has come upon the church? Nothing strange is happening to you. We saw that earlier. And what Peter is telling us here is, look, this is not outside of God's plan and purpose. In fact, it is the God-ordained season for judgment to begin with the household of God. Next, another term here. That leads us to the term judgment. So let's spend some time here. What exactly is the judgment that the household of God is facing? Well, I'm going to argue it is the refining, fiery trial. That's the judgment. But for the sake of good, well-rounded, biblical understanding here, it is important that we emphasize two aspects of God's judgment as it relates to his people, the household of God. One aspect of judgment is completed, and the other one is ongoing. So first, the completed aspect of God's judgment as it relates to the church. And I'll frame it like this. God's righteous wrath is satisfied. It's a done deal. It's a completed work. So one aspect of God's judgment, and maybe what comes to your mind when you think of judgment, is God pouring out his wrath, his righteous wrath, upon sin, upon our sin. You see, God has made it clear in his word that our sinful rebellion is an offense to the holy God. And his holiness demands justice. I mean, what kind of God would God be if he allowed sin to run unchecked and rampant through his creation and through his people forever? Well, he certainly wouldn't be the God of the Bible and the God revealed in the Bible who is holy and just and righteous and loving and compassionate. A friend of mine has a great illustration along these lines. He talks about how, uh, let's say a crime is committed in your home. You know, thieves come in and clear you out, so you call up the police to come and investigate the crime, and they show up, and they take notes. Here's what was taken, and here's what was taken, and here's what happened, and here's what time it happened. And then at the end of all of that, the police say, hey, good luck. We hope everything turns out all right. Well, you would say to the police, wait a minute, aren't you going after the criminals here? Aren't you going to punish this crime? And the police say, no. Look, the loving and compassionate thing to do is just to let this crime go unchecked. Not only would you say these officers are not just and they're not concerned with justice, you'd say they're not very loving and compassionate either to allow this crime against me to go unchecked. Well, in a similar way, our God 
who is righteous and holy and just and loving and compassionate must deal with sin. And in our sin and sinful rebellion, it must receive a just penalty and punishment. And the Bible tells us what that penalty is. The wages of sin is death. But here's the great news, beloved ones. God, in his great mercy and grace, has provided his own son as a substitute, the perfect and sinless substitute to take our place and to bear that judgment, that penalty for us. This is what Jesus came to do. This was his mission, to die on the cross in our place. And on that cross, what was happening there? Christ suffered the wrath of God that should have been ours. He bore it in his body for us and in our place. The judgment that should have been ours, the pouring out of God's righteous wrath that should have come upon us for our sinful rebellion, Christ bore that for us. And there, God's wrath is completely satisfied once and for all time on behalf of his people. Isaiah describes the substitutionary death of the Messiah in this way. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening that brought us peace fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Believer, think of this great and praiseworthy and God-glorifying truth. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, We will never face the wrath of God against our sin. What does the Apostle Paul say? God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think about God's judgment as a pouring out of his righteous wrath against sin in relationship to his people, in relationship to his church, the household of God, that judgment is complete. It's a finished work. Christ took that judgment for us. But there is another aspect to God's judgment as it relates to the household of God. And from the context of this section, this is what Peter has in mind here in verse 17 when he talks about judgment. And that is the ongoing refinement of God's people. The judgment that has come upon God's household here is... Going back to verse 12, the fiery trial of persecution that has come upon you. But here's the thing. This judgment, this suffering, is not wrath-oriented judgment. That's already been satisfied. Remember, that we don't bear that judgment. This suffering is refinement-oriented judgment. And it's not to be feared. In fact, it is even grounds for rejoicing. To the degree that you suffer for the name of Christ, keep on rejoicing. And we even see in in verse 16 that it's grounds for glorifying God. By the way, defining judgment as God's refining work, we see that elsewhere in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 32 Paul says there, when we are judged, and he's talking to believers and about believers, when we are judged, he says we're disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned with the world. Judgment there is God's refining discipline, just like any good father would do with his children. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul is talking to believers there about the persecution and afflictions that they are facing and the love and perseverance that these afflictions are producing. And Paul says there, he describes it there as, this is God's righteous judgment. So defining judgment as God's refining of his people, we see that all through the scriptures. And we see that here in this letter of 1 Peter, going all the way back to chapter 1 and verse 6, as we have said before, One of the ways that God refines his people to be more and more like Christ. One of the ways that God burns off all the stuff we would look to and rely on other than Christ. 
One of the ways that God builds strength of faith and endurance in His people and prepares us to meet Jesus with praise and honor and glory is through the fiery trial that Peter says has come upon you for your testing. This is an aspect of God's judgment toward the household of God, but it is not wrath-oriented. It is refinement-oriented. So believer, this fiery trial, it is not God punishing you. As a condemned sinner, it is God purifying you as a Christ-bought saint. And because of this, now let's relate it back to verse 16, because of this, you glorify God in this name of Christ. Remember, verse 17 and even verse 18, all of this is support for if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but glorify God in this name of Christian. Glorify God in this name of Christ. Glorify God that you bear this name of Christ. Why? Because this suffering for Christ's name is the Father graciously refining us so that we are found relying on our Lord Jesus and rejoicing in Christ all the more, and eagerly anticipating His coming all the more. I mean, in the midst of suffering that fiery trial, do you ever find yourself saying, even so, come Lord Jesus? Absolutely we do. You see, this fiery trial of judgment, it's God refining us, and so when it comes, we glorify God in this name of Christ. And this fiery trial of judgment only reveals all the more that we belong to Him and are of His household. This is what has come upon the household of God. It, it shows all the more we belong to Him. So, it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Yes, there's a, the completed aspect of God's judgment as His wrath is poured out against our sin upon Christ so that we would never have to bear it. That wrath is satisfied. But there's the ongoing aspect of God's judgment. That doesn't have anything to do with wrath, but with refinement, and that's what's going on here. God brings the fiery trial for the testing of our faith. And Peter says, look, this is the God-ordained season we are in. And by the way, beloved ones, it is a season. It's for a limited time. And one day, and it could be any day, Christ will return for his church. Now, staying right there in verse 17, let's move on. You will notice Peter says there, he goes on to ask a question. He says, if the judgment begins with us first, it starts with us, what is the end? What is the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, we know for the household of God, God's righteous wrath is satisfied. His refining work is being accomplished. But what about those who will come to the end and they have known nothing of this saving work applied to their lives? Well, first, let's define what is the gospel of God. Those who disobey the gospel of God. It's just what we've been saying. This is the good news. God has offered up his son in our place, to satisfy his wrath against our sin. And through Christ, our sins are paid for in full and forgiven. And through him, we have peace with God. We are brought into right and reconciled relationship with him. That's the good news of God. But Peter's asking here, what will be the end for those who disobey, those who disbelieve, those who reject this good news? What will be the end for those who do not have Christ as their sin-bearing, wrath-satisfying substitute? Now we know from elsewhere in Scripture, Revelation 20, for example, verses 11 and following, here's what the end will be. They will have to bear the full weight of God's wrath upon themselves and face eternal punishment. But right here in our text, here's what Peter's doing. This was customary in Jewish tradition, a way of arguing, and Peter is arguing from the lesser to the greater. He's saying, look, if this fiery trial has come upon the household of God, what will be the end 
what will be the fiery trial that comes upon those who reject Christ? And as Peter so often does in this letter, we've seen time and time again, he supports his argument with a quote from the Scripture. That's verse 18, Proverbs 11, where he asks a similar question but using the Scripture. He says, if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, just pause there for a minute, with difficulty, that does not mean that it's difficult for God to save. But in our context, Peter's pointing to the truth that for those whom God saves, it comes along with difficulty, doesn't it? It comes along with the fiery trial. That will be part of the path. If judgment, the fiery trial, comes upon the household of God, upon the righteous ones, here's the question, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? What will become of the unsaved? Now, Peter's just asking the same question, but he's using Proverbs 11.31 to ask the question. What will become of the unsaved? And here's the answer. Another kind of fiery ordeal awaits. We will learn this over in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Peter says there, By God's word, the present heaven and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. There's that term ungodly again. So there's the fiery trial of judgment that comes upon the household of God. That's refinement oriented. But then there's the fiery ordeal that comes upon the unsaved and it is unto destruction. This too is part of why we glorify God that we bear the name of Christ. Because, beloved ones, we know now what our end would be without God saving us. We know now what our end would be without God enabling us to hear and believe the good news of God. And what our end would be without God effectively applying Christ's atoning work to our lives and saving us. We know what our end would be. It would be a fiery trial of judgment, but not a refining one, but one unto destruction. And so we glorify God that we bear this name of Christ. This is the one who has saved us. Christ is the one who has rescued us. I'm reminded here in this section, thinking about perceiving the end of the ungodly and how it brings us to rejoice all the more and glorify all the more in God who has saved us. I'm reminded here of old Asaph in Psalm 73, who said, when he looked at the world around him, he said, my feet almost slipped, for I was envious of the wicked. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, they do whatever they want. They're always at ease. They increase in wealth. And he says, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, for I have been stricken and chastened all day. There's the fiery ordeal. He says, until I came into the sanctuary of God, and then I perceived their end. And he says, here's, here's what he perceived. God, you have set them upon slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How are they? They are destroyed in a moment. But this didn't lead Asaph to an arrogance toward the world, but only a greater awe-filled praise of his God. Because he says later in the psalm, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The nearness of God is my good. You see, seeing the end of the wicked for Asaph, it wasn't like, hey, this is what's coming upon you, wicked ones. It is Praise God that I have God. And here in Peter, it's a similar kind of theme. We are perceiving the end of those who are without Christ, but what does it do? It leads us all the more to glorify God in the name of Christ. Praise God that you have 
God. Now, in verse 19, let's move on here. In verse 19, Peter sums up the matter. He sums up the section with a final command. And here's the command. He says, therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God, so that's the God-ordained fiery trial, that's the refining judgment, those who suffer according to the will of God are to do what? Here's the command. And trust your soul to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Doing what is right. There's an interpretive decision that needs to be made here. Some take this doing what is right as applying to believers. That is to say, we are to do what is right. And when insult and reproach come our way for doing what is right, well, what are we supposed to do? And trust ourselves and trust our soul to our faithful creator. Others see this doing what is right, and I would fall into this camp, that it is God who is doing what is right. Yes, reviling and reproach and insult and threats will come our way. And as we have learned in this section and in this letter, this is by God's hand. It is by God's design. It is the season we are in. It is of the will of God. And we are to entrust ourselves to our faithful creator that he is doing what is right. We saw the same kind of theme back in chapter 2 where you will remember Peter says, Follow Christ's example in the suffering. And what was Christ's example? He entrusted himself unto God who judges righteously. And here in verse 19, you suffer according to the will of God and trust your soul to a faithful creator in doing what is right, that he is doing what is right. God has my life. God has my soul in his hands, and he is faithful and even though this trial hurts and it's hard to comprehend and I don't understand how it's all fitting together, he has brought it according to his will and he is trustworthy to do what is right in the midst of it. I'm very interested here, and we'll close with this. Peter describes God as faithful creator. Now we understand the faithful, the, the trustworthy part, but what about creator? Peter is reminding us that God is our creator and that just as he has given us life, just as he has given us new life in Christ, and it is this life he holds in his hands, we can trust him with our life, even in the midst of suffering, that he will be faithful in doing what is right. And absolutely that is true. But let's move out a little further on the limb here as we close today. Faithful creator. Creator takes us back to creation, where you will remember God created everything, all that is, including Adam and Eve. But you will remember that when through Adam and Eve, sin infiltrates God's good and very good creation, God must bring judgment. He must bring consequence and discipline upon his children. But in the midst of that judgment, what do we see? God is also shown to be gracious and merciful and faithful to provide not only for the needs in the moment for Adam and Eve and for his creation, but provide a great promise that through Eve, God would send one who would rescue God's creation from the curse of sin and death. And beloved ones, in the fullness of time, God did just that. In the fullness of time, God, our faithful creator, kept his promise. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die for our sins and to reconcile us unto him. Here's the point. God has proven faithful, a trustworthy creator. So even if you suffer according to God's will, he has a track record of trustworthiness, a track record of faithfulness, going all the way back to the beginning of creation. He's faithful to his people. He's faithful to keep his promises. 
You entrust your soul, the care of your soul, your life to a faithful creator. He is doing what is right and good and will be for our good and will bring him great glory as the sun is exalted. Well, let's finish today with a prayer. Father, we give you praise today for the Lord Jesus Christ and that by your saving mercy we belong to him and we bear his name. And Father, for any suffering you bring our way, and particularly on the account of the Lord Jesus Christ, help us to see it for what it is, your refinement and not wrath. And Father, may we trust in you, our faithful creator, in doing what is right. And we look unto you today to provide in all things, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.